And uh, so, yeah, this is part two of the T25 build that we did the other night. Uh, for those of you who haven't, who haven't already seen it, um, I am archiving them on the Mike Parts website. There's a page of video tutorials that um, we'll list this one and that one and whatever else we do. I'm actually thinking about doing a series of these every Saturday, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so the other night what we did was build the T25, and um, at the very end couldn't quite finish it uh, because I made a mistake, um, which was actually quickly rectified once uh, I stopped the stream. Um, and so I'm going to jump right back into it um, where I left off. Typically, what people would want to do the first time they've, uh, as soon as they've finished the microphone, is to plug it in and see if it works. And it's always a nice feeling when you do that. Um, apply phantom power, and, and you instantly see the level meter on your audio device showing signal. Uh, so I'm going to do that right now. This is the mic uh, that I built the other night, with the one change being that I soldered that one wire that uh, I had done badly the first time. So this is not on yet. You're hearing me through a different microphone, but I'm going to switch that. And what you're going to hear is hum, because this mic has no body on it. <clears throat> Right on. More people joining. Appreciate that. Thanks, guys. So um, so anyway, uh, when I turn this up, you'll hear the hum, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. So so this should be live. You should be hearing me through this microphone right now. Um, now, uh, and this should be better. I'm not monitoring this. Maybe I should be. One sec. All right. Uh, I'm sort of surrounded by cables, cameras, lights. So it's a little fragile here right now. Um, so yeah, now without the hand, watch this. Oh, it's actually not bad. You can probably hear some hum. Um, every condenser mic uh, without a body on it will hum. And uh, the reason is that there's EMI, RFI all around us and it's getting into the circuit and uh, jumping into the audio circuit. Uh, and although you wouldn't do this in a production sense for quick benchtop testing, you can just sort of do this thing um, in order to shield the hum. So again, this is without, I don't hear any hum right now. When I take my hands away, there is hum. Anyway, uh, for a quick test, uh, you can see that, uh, that that works pretty well. And the point is just as, as like a, a, a proof of life, right? We've just built this mic, we've plugged it in, it works great, that's awesome. Um, and it's always an exciting thing because if it doesn't work, then you have to debug it. And there are uh, notes about that in the, in the build guide for this and for all the mic kits that I sell, there's a step-by-step -step, um, set of troubleshooting instructions. And we're gonna go through some of that in this stream. Uh, but for our purposes right now, this is awesome um, because it works. So let me switch back. to the other room mic. And I'm also going to uh, do something that, uh, demonstrate something else that, um, boy, it was nice and clear before. Move this guy a little closer. So uh, I'll also demonstrate the voltage test that we would normally do um, when we've just built a mic. So let me go to here. All right, now, um, one of the important things to remember, is that gonna work? That's gonna work. Uh, about testing voltages on a microphone like this is that you don't wanna listen to it, right? You don't want uh, live audio while you are uh, probing the circuit with a multimeter because it's gonna make noise and it's gonna blow your tweeter or your speakers or your headphones. So I'm about to plug this in, but I've got the audio output turned off, and I definitely recommend doing that. Um, I wonder if, no, it's gonna be okay. 
So uh, next step is to pull out the trusty multimeter and set it to DC voltage like that. And then we can plug in the microphone to phantom power. And then we can check a few voltages. Okay, so black probe would go on ground, which is the mic's chassis. And then the red probe would be whatever it is that we would want to touch the red probe to whatever it is we're measuring the voltage of. And uh, what you don't want to do when you measure voltage in a microphone is have this um, short two different things. You don't want the red probe or, or the black one really, uh, but you for sure don't want the red probe to touch two different parts of the circuit simultaneously. So you have to be very careful of what you touch and you have to be aware of where the shaft is, not just the tip that you're touching to something, but the shaft too. It's similar to with a soldering iron. You know, when you're soldering with the, with the tip of the iron, you need to be careful because this part back here is hot too. And if you brush that up against a capacitor or something, um, you're gonna cause problems. And I have seen that when people are soldering the input joint of a mic, for example, and they'll, the mic will show a burn mark in here somewhere. Uh, which means that the shaft ran into the capacitor that was near it as they're working up here, which is why it's always a bad idea to solder from the top side of the board. Um, through hole components were designed to be soldered from underneath. So that's what we do. Anyway, black probe on chassis and red probe on the thing we want to test. So one of the first things to, and so chassis can be anywhere, right? Black probe can be any part of the mic chassis, uh, anywhere where that probe will stick. And I, what I like to use, and I'm not seeing where it went off to in my mess of cables over there, but uh, if you can get a, a set of leads, uh, test leads for your multimeter that have an alligator clip on the end, that's really helpful because then you can actually clip it onto the mic chassis and you don't have to worry about having two hands uh, to, to hold at the same time. Okay, so first thing to check is XLR1, um, which is ground, and ground means zero. And um, there it is, one, two, three, four. So we come in like this and move the hand, and that's zero volts. That's exactly what you want to see. So if you ever build one of my microphones, or really any microphone kit, um, XLR1 should be zero volts DC even when it's plugged in, um, because that's ground. Now, if you measure XLR1 and you see a positive voltage there, uh, you should unplug the mic, because the most likely explanation is that you uh, swapped the XLR wires, meaning the wires from the XLR jack to the circuit board. Um, why don't we take a quick look at that, just to demonstrate what I'm talking about there. Um, it's, it's easy to look at one of these uh, you know, so here's XLR1, or a, a, a typical XLR3, an XLR3 jack, right? Pin one, pin two, pin three. Now, when you look at it, it's not one, two, three, because you're, you're looking at the other end of it. So it's one, two, three on the bottom. So, and if you don't make that sort of mental transposition, then you risk connecting XLR2, pin XLR2 to the XLR1 pad on the circuit board. It's happened a bunch. I've seen it happen a bunch. Um, and the way to be sure what wire you're dealing with is to put the meter into continuity mode, which on this meter is right here. Come on. You can focus today. Here we go. And then turn the sound on. And the way you know that it's in continuity mode is, I'm sure you can hear that. That means when these are touching, there is continuity. So the way to verify that your XLR wires are connected properly is to touch the one probe, doesn't matter which one, to one of the pins. So let me grab XLR2 and you know, this is gonna be easier with a different, let's see, maybe this won't work. So this is what I was talking about before. This is not the one that I was looking for, but this is a uh, test probe with an alligator clip at one end. And it's nice because it clips onto things and doesn't move. So just do this. So now, 
Now we can clip this onto, for example, XLR2, and you need to be careful that you're not also touching the housing, okay? Because the housing is common with pin one. Let's just prove that real quick. So here's the housing and here's pin one. You can hear the beep there, right? So I'm, pin one is common with the chassis. So if when you're testing continuity on pin two, um, if the clip is leaning up against the housing, then you're gonna get all kinds of spurious results, right? So when what you wanna do is clip that on there in such a way that you're pretty confident that it's not, that it, meaning the clip, the alligator clip is not actually touching anything but that pin that you've clipped it to. Okay, so uh, we can quickly probe the other two pins. Okay, uh, I, I can explain that, but let's come back to this. Um, what we're checking is, sorry, what we're checking is uh, XLR2. What have I done? All right, now something is definitely going wrong. <laughs> There we go. So that's my XLR2. And here's my XLR3 right there. Okay. So uh, once again, if you were to, to probe from pin one, grab that on pin one and get a beep out of one of these other pins, then you would know something's wrong. But again, the same thing would be demonstrated by um, seeing positive voltage at one of those other pins. Um, Okay, so where were we? We were checking voltages. Let's see. Make sure this doesn't die on me. Is that backwards? Okay. Voltages. Where'd we go? So, all right, so now I can clip this to the chassis and I can measure DC voltage. So I got to come back here to. Uh, BDC and measure again um, XLR1 is going to be zero as expected and then there's three and then there's two all right so you want two and three in a mic that's working properly uh, of this design um, and perhaps all designs but I don't want to generalize um, you would see even voltages at two and three. So that's a good thing. And one of the other things, and the manual shows some other things that we could test, and I'm not gonna go into them all because this mic is working. I'll point out just one, and that is the JFET source and drain. Uh, so the JFET has one pin, it's a three pin device, and one pin is the audio input. Uh, and that's, that's the one that's connected here. We saw this uh, the other night. So, that's the gate pin, which in this JFET is pin three. Um, and then the source and drain are gonna be pins one and two. And most JFETs are actually symmetrical. Um, in this, the way this one is built, pin one is source, pin two is drain. Um, it would work the other way depending on the circuit. But what you definitely want to see is a lower voltage at the source than at the drain. And so what we're gonna do is come in here on pin one and if I can zoom in anymore here, all the way. Yeah, so you can actually see pins one and two of the JFET right in here. Okay, so I'm gonna come in on one and again, be very careful that I'm not going to accidentally short the shaft of this against one of these exposed resistor leads. So I very carefully come in here and I'm touching pin one, 0.7 volts. You can see that in the background. That's good, that's real good. And then to get to pin two of the JFET, I can do it from the same direction. Just have to be really careful. And there's pin two, 4.8 volts. All right, so that's what we wanna see is, is a bigger voltage, three to five times bigger at the drain than at the source. So that's the voltage measurements that I wanted to show. Uh, the other things I wanted to show were about finishing this mic um, because you know we got it soldered together, it works, that's great but I wouldn't call it done. Uh, 
the other night I was eager to call it done because it had been a long stream. Um, but there are things that you would typically do that you would want to do in order to uh, finish it, make it nice and um, make it last as well. Uh, so one thing that we'll do is, um, whoops, I'll fall down, is clean up this input, input joint a little bit. And by clean up, I mean, take away some of the excess lead material that's in there. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it just looks bad uh, and it kind of bothers me. And like I said before, we can do a nicer job on these than, um, than some people and some companies do. So we can clean that up. And the other thing is uh, we, we want to literally clean it. We want to scrub it with some solvent. But if we, if we put a cotton swab in there, all those sharp edges are going to shred the cotton swab. And then we have a bunch of cotton stuck on that joint. And that's not great. So what I'm going to try to do is come back to here. Is that working? Yeah. And so I can probably focus that down a little bit too. Look at that. Now you can actually see the flux in there. If you see that sort of uh, goopy yellow stuff right in right about there, that's actually flux. So solder has, most solder has uh, rosin in it. And um, that's there to help the solder flow. Without it, it you know, soldering would be much more difficult, but you don't really want that stuff on your, uh, on your, your joints, on your solder joints, because it, it's kind of gummy and it, it attracts dirt and dirt will stick to it. And over time, that's bad. That, be, that can become a bad thing. And so uh, we want to clean that stuff off there. Now, there are some solders that have uh, water washable flux. Um, but that's not what I used. Um, so we're going to have to clean this off with solvent. But first, what I'm going to do is try to trim off some of those things, those metal leads that are poking out. And it is tight quarters down here, and I don't know how well I can, uh, how well you'll be able to see it. Yeah, maybe not so well at all. Okay, let me try to grab these two. All right. And what you see here is the uh, right there is the end of this red wire. And we don't need that there. I'm going to have to bring this out where I can see it better. I'll do this. How about that? All right. You know what? One moment. Might be as good as I can get it. Why don't we call it there? Come back to here. You see all that uh, like contamination, all those speckles around the bottom of the board. I think what that is is when I clipped off the end of the red wire, it was kind of covered in flux. That's just where the flux had ended up, and it kind of just shattered. Meaning the flux, that little deposit of amber colored stuff just sort of exploded and made a big goopy mess in there. So that's gross. Um, so why don't we clean all that out? So what we'll do 
is do some cleaning. All right, so what I like to use are these and this stuff. So I probably showed this the other night. Um, this is 99% isopropyl. You don't want to leave this uncapped because it's highly volatile. So I suspect it would evaporate and uh, be all over your office. Oh, I can show this too. Here, look at this guy. Look at the, uh, yeah, that's the, the CG joint. You can see how that's all gross and smeary as well. All that, that big shiny blob um, is all flux from soldering that one wire. So we can make that go away. So you just take the Q-tip, which I've uh, wet in solvent, and you just sort of scrub. Now, what you don't want to do is let this solvent drip on the capsule uh, because it will uh, probably ruin it. And in microphones that have polystyrene capacitors, um, which I can grab in a second to show in case you don't know what those are, polystyrene is also easily, uh, it melts in some solvents. Um, I've never actually done it, never tested it. Maybe that would be an interesting thing to do. So, so you just scrub till the flux comes off and then I, co I come back and I, I kind of swab it dry so that the alcohol doesn't leave any weird uh, residue. So here's what the CG joint, where'd it go? Look at that. See, no more nasty uh, flux deposit there. So we'll come back to here. I feel like I saw one. Sometimes flux will spray, like you'll be, um, after you're finished with the microphone, you'll uh, find droplets of flux in weird places. Um, here's one other trick too. So what I'm doing is I'm just, I don't know if you can see it in the little face cam here. I'm literally just dunking a Q-tip into this giant bottle. It's not super convenient and you risk spilling. So it's really not a good idea, but I don't have a smaller container uh, to put that in. But sometimes you get so much on here uh, that it, when you, when you press this into the circuit board, it's going to pool and make a mess. So what I sometimes do is just sort of shake it, you know, like you're, like you're cleaning out a paintbrush, shake this into the trash can like that. So there's less solvent on here and, and it's going to make less of a flood on my circuit board. So I feel like I saw something right in here. I'm going to clean that up. Looks like audio is still working. That's a treat. Thanks, YouTube. Okay, let's check here. Yeah. Okay, that's that one. Now let's clean up this kind of general grossness. Is that a clean one? Here it is. Um, also, you probably don't want to reuse these because once you've got, uh, looks like it's going right up my nose. <laughs> once you've cleaned some deposits up with this, you don't want to put that flux back on the board. So I'm I'm always turning this back around to use the other side or just discard it. You know, we buy these in uh, giant bins of 500, 625 pieces. Not sponsored, by the way. Just a product that we use. Okay, so now to this flux explosion up here, and then we'll get to that input join as well. All right. That's much better. And then for the input join, it's it's um, it's, you can tell which end is wet if you sniff it. Uh, it's much the same as before. You just sort of rub this as best you can. And, and you know what works well uh, in a lot of cases is that instead of trying to like scrub it back and forth, 
you lay the swab on there and just sort of turn it like that and try to get a couple different sides, a couple different angles. And you will leave some threads on the on the joint because it's it's sharp. All right. How'd we do? Yeah, look at that. So that big gross yellow gold blob is gone. All that explosion is gone. I do see a thread. Let's see if I can get that out of there. The best way to oh, that didn't work at all. The best way to um, to find uh, cotton threads that are left over in your build is uh, obviously clean it as best you can, and then. Um, and then take a photo of it for the manual. <laughs> and then you'll find all the threads you couldn't find before. And you have to Photoshop them out. All right. So that's cleaning the input joint. And uh, what else do we have? So a couple things we could do now. The easy way out would be to just clean up these joints at the bottom. I mean, you can see this is the same issue as that we just saw, right? All of these have flux. Uh, deposits all over. Focus. A little hard to see, but you can see it on that side. There you go. So that's super gross. Um, so we could just trim the sharp ones. That XLR1 is a little sharp there. We could trim these down and then scrub it out. And if this was my mic, I'd probably do that. But this mic is going out. Um, so, uh, because we award this mic to one of the viewers from the other day. So what I'm gonna do is show how to uh, shorten the transformer wires a little bit and, um, and then we'll clean the joints after that. So I, I won't do them all here in the stream because that's super tedious, but I will demonstrate the, the right way and, uh, or the way that I desolder wires. Um, now, this is actually kind of addressing what happened the other night as well on the first stream because I desoldered a wire and when I pulled it through, um, it pulled all the solder in behind it, which plugged up the hole, which is a pain. It can be a pain to remove. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is try to remove some of the solder first. And the way I do that is with solder wick. So this is a solder wick with flux inside it, which helps the solder flow. You can also get a liquid flux. Let me show that. So unfortunately you have to buy this in giant bottles. Um, oops, there we go. So uh, this is liquid flux, but it came in like a quart. Uh, and, and this is great for desoldering. It's it's great for surface mount soldering as well, which maybe we'll do in a future stream. Um, anyway, shouldn't need it right now. So we take uh, take our flux impregnated wick, clean off to get a uh, an end, a bare end, and then let's just start here at the outside. So my iron is hot. It's not clean though. Let's do that first. So one would need solder, here it is. So the iron's hot and clean, and you can't see what I'm doing. How about that? So we lay the wick on top and we remove the solder first. 
you certainly could just heat the joint and pull the wire out from behind. But like I said, that sucks the solder into the joint, which is not what we want, not into the joint, but into the, the through hole. So check that out. So there's um, all the solder that I just removed from that joint. And then this, it's pretty cool. So we just took all the solder off. So that wire might actually be free. Which is a better way to do it. So then we can I have to remove this board just to get access to the back side of the audio circuit board. By the way, these screwdrivers are are nice. I don't know if you saw what I just did there, but the top is uh, it pivots or swivels. So it's nice for one-handed operation. When you put this on something, you can just one-handed unscrew things. All right, so we took out TS1, which is the orange one. So now it's not actually free. So that means a little solder went through um, and is holding it inside. It's not a problem. Usually what you can do is just sort of grab the wire from behind. And then without letting the shaft of the iron torch part of your circuit. Do you guys see that? Yeah. There it is. Look at that. It took like a millisecond of heat to pop that wire free. All right. So why don't we do one more? Oh, and then we can also check that our joint is still clean. That's the best way to do that. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the light shining through there, that TS2. That's what you want. If, you're, uh, if you have a solder pad or a through hole that is plugged up, there are multiple ways to clean it. And I had to do this the other night because I plugged one of the holes. Um, wick is probably the best way. Uh, sometimes the through hole gets really stubbornly stuck, like it's really plugged up. Um, and there's a couple of alternate techniques that, that can help with that. Wick is still one of the key tools. Um, sometimes adding fresh solder to the top, uh, which is counterintuitive, but you, you can add fresh solder to the top and then lay the wick on and then put the heat on top of the wick and the fresh solder melts and heats up. It acts like a transmission, like it, it conducts the heat into the through hole and liquefies that solder. And then it all comes out together. So that's pretty effective. Flipping the board over and doing the same thing on the, on the other side can also be effective. Um, and then in some cases, well, I should mention there's, elect there's electric solder pumps as well, um, which is a basically a soldering iron with a hollow tip that will pull air through it. And uh, those work, but, and we have one, but I almost never use it because they get, they, get, uh, they get clogged pretty easily and they have to be cleaned, like even back in the motor, because you're basically, it's like a vacuum cleaner. You know, you're pulling all the dirt into the device itself. And there's all sorts of mechanisms that try to block the solder and the flux and the fumes from getting inside the unit, but they, they do get in there. And so you have to take it apart and clean out the internal filter, which when we, the first time we did it was like dripping with flux. It was super gross. Um, so I find that I spend more time cleaning that thing than actually sucking solder with it. So I tend not to use that. And that's, uh, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a Hacko electric solder sucker. I don't remember what the model number is. The other tool that you can use, these are kind of cool, but also kind of a pain and they take a delicate touch. These are called solder needles. I think they're called solder needles. You can buy these on Amazon and they're a couple of dollars. And my only gripe about these is that you have to buy this entire eight piece kit of which only one of them is of any use because these are all different sizes. I mean, you can see, the, and these are basically just hollow metal tubes and the idea is that you can, you know, put this up against the through hole, heat it up and, and shove it through. And, uh, and it, it does actually work, but 
out of this whole set, this is the only one, this tiniest one is the only one that actually fits any of the circuit boards that I make. Um, I mean, there might be a couple of capacitors um, on some of the boards where some of the other ones work. And it looks like it comes with just a, a solid needle as well. I don't know that I've used that. Maybe that one would be of some use. Uh, so what the idea of this is that you would put this, you know, behind the solder pad that you wanted to clear and then lay the heat on this and then plunge it through. And it can work, but the risks are if you hold the heat on this for too long, uh, this plastic handle will soften and it'll shove the needle back up into the handle, which, and then you have to throw it out then, or, or buy another set for five bucks and throw away another seven needles. So that's one risk. The other is that, as you can see, these things are prone to bend because this is really small. I don't know what the diameter of this is, um, but it's less than a millimeter. Because that's about the size of, um, of the solder pads that we tend to use. So 0.79 millimeters is the outside diameter of this thing. That's, uh, there you go. So not very big, not very strong. All right, question from Michael. Uh, the T25 is awesome, really great, but what if you want to use a non electric LDC capsule? Which kit is best for that to install in the 700 or 800 body? Okay, uh, so we'll take a detour. We can talk about that for sure. Thank you for asking. Um, so this, you know, I didn't bring, I'm not set up to show the schematic that I showed at the end of the last stream, but the, uh, when you go back and look at that, uh, or, or go to the Recording Hacks website and, and pull down the, um, uh, the Recording Hacks profile for the, sh uh, for the Neumann KM84, there's a schematic linked from the sidebar. And you can see the original CMC5, sorry, K the original KM84 schematic. And what you'll see there is that there are two uh, rails, two power rails that come off of the transformer. So phantom comes in through the transformer, then there's two 2.2K resistors in the center of those. It's kind of like a center tap. Uh, there's a circuit that comes off that and, and there's two legs of it. And one goes to the JFET drain and it powers the JFET. And that's in this mic. And then there's a second one that would go through, uh, if I remember right, two RC filters to filter out noise and then it powers the capsule. And that's not in this mic because this is an electorate design which doesn't need, uh, doesn't need power for the capsule. The capsule is pre-polarized in this design. So you can't put a, an externally biased capsule on this circuit. Um, now, there is, clearly the KM84 circuit will support a large diaphragm capsule. Um, this one won't, this version of it won't because it, it was built for an electric capsule. So the parts that you would need to power it simply aren't there. So what you would need to do is build this instead. Okay, so this is the large diaphragm version of, the, of this same circuit. And this actually has the schematic in the back. So this is what I was talking about. So for an externally biased capsule, you need this power rail, okay? And there's a few extra bits that are thrown in to make the whole thing work. So here's the first RC, 10 meg ohm, 0.1, and the second one, 10 meg ohm, 0.1. Those are the two RC filters that take this power supply here. Um, See, it's coming off the junction of these two 2.2K. One leg feeds the JFET drain. Other leg comes up here and feeds the, uh, the capsule. So will this fit a BM700 body? I don't remember. Um, it might. Um, is this a... Yeah, I just don't know. Let me see. 
I think the I think the chassis of this is a very similar size, but if so, then <laughs> then that answers the question. It's going to be a hard no on this one. Um, you know, I, it, it's it could be done. Uh, one could make a version of this circuit that fits a smaller body like this. You'd have to sacrifice something, most likely this really nice big film output cap. If you were to put a smaller capacitor into this kind of design, you could shrink this down. Because you can see there's some, there's some space here that you could condense. So, uh, so yeah, it could be done, but, but this, this particular circuit will not fit, as far as I know, as far as I can tell sitting here right now, will not fit the BM700, BM800 body. So, I mean, the only reason to use those though is that they're cheap but they're, they're made really cheaply too. Um, so if you're on a really tight budget, uh, then you know those things can make sense. But if you have money for a nicer circuit and a bigger capsule, then you know the additional spend for a nicer piece of metal work maybe hopefully isn't out of reach. Um, cool. All right, let's do one more. Um, so we pulled out TS2, and uh, so I don't have to go crazy later. TS2 was orange, and um, I'm gonna write that down. Just for my own notes. Okay, so we kind of talked about desoldering. Now we're going to do another one that's hopefully uh, relatively easy. So we'll grab TP2, which is the third one here. All right, how'd we do on this one? TP2. I think where what people sometimes miss about DIY, I mean, there is a, um, there is a, uh, a mindset among some DIY people that, uh, you know, as it has been expressed to me via irate email occasionally, you know, resistors cost 20 cents. So why doesn't the microphone kit cost $5? Because there's only this many resistors and this many capacitors and everyone knows these only cost, you know, this many cents and that many cents. And while that's true, uh, what, what that idea misses is that buying the components, the passive components is like the smallest part of any kit design. Um, designing the circuit boards is a much bigger piece. Figuring out which components to use is a really big piece because you can't just take any old part. I mean, you could, and it might work. Will it sound good? I mean, that's where some of the value add comes in is figuring out what actually works well together. And then the other piece is Things like I mentioned the other night is biasing the JFET. Uh, that's not, I mean, that requires expensive gear to do. It, it requires time. There's a selection process. You know, we, we buy a certain JFET and they don't all pass. We'll put them in the rig and some of them just don't work in this circuit because of IDSS or some other, um, some other characteristic that varies from one part to the next. Um, so there's a selection process and then the biasing process and then having all the parts on hand to, you know, to create that. So, um, so there, there's a little more to it than just uh, buying some parts. Okay, so now I've got those two uh, desoldered and the holes are clean, which is awesome. So what we wanna do next is just shorten these a little bit. So uh, it isn't necessary to shorten these to make the mic sound better necessarily. Like, I don't know that anyone would ever hear the difference between I mean, what do we have here? Three inches of wire and an inch and a half of wire. 
there is a practical consideration. If you cut the wires too short, they won't reach where they need to go. And that sucks. The other thing about DIY is, and this applies also to capsule wires, is uh, I like people to keep in mind that they might want to make a change at some point. So, I mean, if, if you've gone to the trouble to build a mic, you know, it's at least possible that you're going to want to swap in a different transformer at some point, just to see what that sounds like or to, to test something. Um, and so if you cut these wires down to little nubs, then your ability to reuse that transformer in some other microphone is, is very much reduced. So uh, there is, as in all things audio, there's always a trade-off. Uh, you have to pick between a couple of opposing things. So uh, just for the purposes of demonstration, I am going to shorten a couple of these just a bit. So I'll take these two, snip off about an inch, and then strip the uh, wire. So I need a bare wire end. Like that. So having the right tool makes that particular job much, much, much easier. All right. Now uh, we can tin these. Um, that's kind of a best practice. I don't always do it if I'm about to solder them anyway because there isn't a lot of time for them to become tarnished. Um, and you also have to be careful when you tin wires that you don't put so much solder on that you can't fit them through the hole in the circuit board anymore. So a little goes a long way. So what I'm going to do here is just kind of twist these a little bit so you don't get stray wires poking out. That's something to watch out for. Um, you know, when you look at a an arrangement like this, there's not a ton of real estate between the solder pads. And so if you stick in a braided wire and it sort of flays out and you get one little wire thread that's grounding or shorting against the next solder pad, that will prevent the mic from working. So it's important to have a good look at this after uh, to make sure that things are connected the way they're supposed to be and nothing's... Um, you know, cross wired or something like that. Okay, solder. So this is how I tin wires. I put a little solder on there and just sort of swab it across the um, across the wire end. You don't need a lot. And uh, as before, I mentioned before, you don't want to do that kind of operation with anything valuable underneath the soldering iron, because if solder or flux does drop, you want it to hit the top of the work surface and not something that you paid for. Okay, so TS2 is orange. So TS2 is the one here on the end. So we drop that one in here. And I will solder these one at a time because it's hard to keep multiple wires to stay in place, in my experience. Um, so I don't try to insert a bunch and then solder all at once, even though that seems like it would be more efficient. And what I'm checking now is, is the mistake I made the other night, which is um, that the insulation hasn't plunged through the hole. So I'm making sure that only bare wire is poking through the hole. So let's see if you can see that here. That looks good. All right, and then we just take a little bit of solder. Good, now we'll do the other one. So now TS2 is orange. So this one is the one that's left over. I should mention too 
one thing to watch out for is you don't want a lot of bare wire showing behind the uh, the solder joint. Let me jump onto the microscope and see if I can show that off. So this wire, yeah, that one looks okay, actually. XLR2 is a good example of what these should be. You want that insulation jacket to come right up to the surface. So XLR1 could be in a little bit, but it's ground, so I'm not so concerned about it. But uh, TP2 is, yeah, that, like that. You wouldn't want that. Okay, so let's see if we can just lay this on the table in such a way that it, I think that's going to be okay. Yeah. I think this is good. So we can trim off TS2 and TP2 and maybe XLR1, and then just clean those up. So this is what that looks like. All right. Looks like we've got a little piece of wire clipping on there. So we'll get that out of there. It's actually, it's a good example. It's, it's um, gummed up in the flux there. So There we go. Okay, so now we can throw this thing back together. Oops, sorry. Okay, last step. Last step is to clean these up. So flux tends to just sort of smear around a lot. So uh, all you can do is just make a couple of passes. It's a reality that the first time you clean it, and this is true, like if you are, you know, scrubbing a, scrubbing a, the back of a circuit board, um, especially where there's a lot of deposits, the first pass that you make especially if you're using like a cotton swab like I am, you're really just pushing the, the flux around. So if you saw the first stream, or also I also have a dedicated video about circuit board cleaning on the Mike Parts website, that technique of wetting a, a folded paper towel and sort of shredding it against the back of the circuit board, that's really effective because it, the contaminated, uh, the, whatever you're cleaning with, in that case, a paper towel, because it's shredding itself, it sort of wipes itself away. So, oops. So that's definitely better than what we had. 
Still some crud around TP2. Uh, those three look pretty clean. So just TP2 is really the only one. So let's make one more pass on that. Whoa, almost got a lap full. Looks good. So uh, the last step that we're going to do is uh, apply conformal coding. Testing one, two. So just for grins, this is the, uh, so this is the mic now that we've rewired the, um, the uh, transformer wires and cleaned up the input joint then uh, we're still getting good signal. The hum is because the body's not installed. Um, so that's why I'm shielding it with my hands. So uh, yeah, so it still sounds really good. And um, I don't have any compression or anything on this. This is just straight into a console or interface. So this mic has a pad switch as well, which I'll demonstrate right now. I'm going to flip this with my thumb. You can see that there in the corner. So this is with the pad switch off, and this is with the pad switch on. So that's about a 10 decibel cut, and that's with the pad switch back off disabled. Um, before we do the next step, you, always, you would always want to do this step, which is to say we're about to apply conformal coating which will seal that high impedance joint against moisture and contaminants. But before we do that, we want to make sure that the mic is working because conformal coating is, um, it just makes a mess. Like if, if, you, if you apply the coating and then realize you have to rework that input joint after you've painted that stuff all over it, then you have to burn it back off and it smells terrible. So it's best to make sure the mic is working the way it's supposed to be before you do that. So that's what we've just done now. All right, so conformal coding is, do I have audio? Yes, yes, test one, two. Yeah, conformal coding is, um, I'll show you the bottle actually, it's right here. Uh, where are we? So this is the stuff that I use. Uh, it's, it's an acrylic paint of sorts and it uh, doesn't smell very good. So I wouldn't recommend uh, doing this in your kitchen. And uh, I would also recommend after you use it, you put the mic somewhere where it can off gas without you or your kids hanging around it. Um, and this is a, like most of the other chemicals that we've talked about. This is not something you want to drip all over the place. Oh man, I can already smell it. It smells a little bit like, I guess, nail polish, perhaps. I'm not sure. I don't wear a lot of nail polish. Um, the question that always comes up is where do you put it? Because I've seen products that are basically dipped in this. Um, but I think that's not necessary. It just makes a mess. So what I do is I get these inexpensive uh, paintbrushes and uh, where we're going to apply it is the high impedance joint. So the high impedance joint is basically everything that's connected to this one gig ohm resistor. So let's jump over here for a closer look. So that's the one gig resistor R2 and you can see it's connected to switch pin four and what else is connected to switch pin four? Well, this red wire is, and the JFET gate, JFET pin three, which is right there, is connected to it as well. 
and that's it when the pad is off. But when we switch this pad on, the switch shorts these two pins internally, pin four to pin six. Um, pin five is not used. You can see it stubbed out there. So, uh, so when the pad is on, this thing here, this joint here is also high impedance. So uh, now that I look at it, I realize we should have uh, cleaned that up a little bit too. So let me do that real quick. We will first clip off that uh, excess sort of pointy bit right here. That's good enough. And then we'll grab one more of these. So I'm just doing the same process as before, but on this other switch pin six to the pad capacitor joint. You can also come in underneath. You can see the angle that I'm working at here. And then I'll dry it a little bit. Okay. So I just used the needle nose to try to remove some threads. These are very difficult to get out. Yeah, you can see them there. Oh, and these, you know, here's the problem. These tweezers don't actually, what's the point of that? Maybe something like this. Might work better. Yeah, like that. Looks like there's still a little bit of residue. You know, that's actually, uh, that's, I don't think that's flux. I think that's alcohol residue on the board and that's not gonna hurt anything because it's not, it's not touching anything that we care about. So, okay, on with the conformal. So this is quick. Um, let me just take, a little bit of this stuff. Oops, there you go. I just have a little bit, maybe a little bit more. And this stuff is, uh, but besides smelling bad, it's very thick, very viscous, and um, you don't want to spill it. And it'll dry out too, we, we've learned that. It, if you let it sit too long, it basically cures in the bottle. This stuff used to come with a built-in brush in, in the lid, which was nice because it's very difficult to clean these brushes. So we just sort of, we clean them in alcohol, but, or rather in thinner, but it, it's not really soluble in thinner, this material. So it doesn't really work very well. And so the brushes tend to harden. So all I'm doing is painting this stuff kind of all over this high impedance joint, meaning everything that's connected to this leg right there. And that's it. Uh, the next step. Check the pad. Pad is on, so I'll turn the pad back off. Get 
that on nice and tight and we're done. So I'll talk one more about one more thing. Um, so this is called the T25. Um, we sell the circuit kit standalone and it can fit into those, the, the inexpensive bodies that Michael asked about, the BM700, BM800. You can buy those mic bodies for like 15 bucks and they are, I mean, they're cheap, really cheap. Like you could just about crumple one in your hand, very thin metal. Um, so, but we do sell the, the capsule with the custom mount, the harness. Um, and uh, let me show you what that is. If you didn't see it the other day. So, uh, yeah. so this is the, the capsule and the, and the mount pre-installed. Um, so we sell this separate and that's the capsule installed in the mount with the right wires. Um, you need a certain kind of wire to work well as a capsule wire. So we sell that as a standalone. We sell the circuit kit on its own as well. If you if your interest is in retrofitting parts into a different donor mic, and then mostly because those common donor mic bodies are so uh, flimsy, we started selling this, which is a, a, a really it's 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 ironically it's the same I think it might be the same tooling as the BM seven hundred BM eight hundred it's just made of much thicker metal, so. Um, and this is the very, very last one of its kind. Uh, this was the first production run of these that we made. And we're out. This is the last one. I, I was lucky to find one left on the shelf to do as, you know, as the mic giveaway for this first stream that we did. So the new ones will be here in about two weeks. This is gone. This was a, the first attempt we had at making a logo. I like it, but we ended up not sticking with it. So the new ones won't have that. They will instead have the Mike Parts Diamond logo badge, which is an embossed brass badge that's glued on. We don't do this anymore either. Um, that was an idea that I had that uh, everybody hated. <laughs> so we won't do that anymore. Uh, so we will have the T25 microphone kit back in stock soon, very soon. Um, and then uh, Jason says lacquer thinner may work with that stuff. You know, I think you're probably right. Um, I'll have to check because I might even have some lacquer thinner. Yeah, I just don't know. Sorry, I'm looking at this bottle. I don't know what I don't know what it needs. I mean, honestly, they probably make whatever solvent you need. I just I haven't done it. So we tend to build a bunch and then do conformal coating on all of them at once. And then, uh, well, I I try to clean them, um, but some other people here just let them harden, <laughs> which works too. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is um, for future streams. So I'm thinking about doing this as a sort of regular Saturday thing. Uh, so I would appreciate feedback on that. I got a lot of great feedback the other night about what people wanted to see. And uh, so I think we're going to try to do some of those things. So this is, this is one of the things that we could do soon. This is the, um, uh, the new version of the multi-track microphone kit. So the multi-track kit was a, a circuit. It's a basically a full Sheps implementation. Um, and the idea of this was that you'd build two of them and they would go back to back into the microphone. Uh, and then the mic would have a five pin XLR on it. And so you can output the front side and the back side separately. And that gives you what I call a multi-track microphone. Other people have called it twin diaphragm. I don't, I'm not really sure what that means. That sounds ambiguous to me, but uh, Austrian Audio has a mic like this. Lewitt Audio has a mic like this. Of course, they're not the first. Uh, other companies have had these uh, for, for years. The benefit of having a microphone with front and back separate outputs is that you can set the polar pattern at mix time, which the first time I read it, not really understanding what that meant, kind of blew my mind that you could go from cardioid to omni to hypercardioid to figure eight or anything in between. Uh, later, like how does that happen? And, uh, and, and why isn't a, a microphone with two capsules in it, even though they're front and back, why isn't that stereo? So uh, the way it works is that even in a, a condenser, a large diaphragm condenser mic, that's a multi-pattern mic, 
it's basically doing the same thing as 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 what this would do. Uh, it just does it via switch on the front of the microphone. So what that means is that uh, Omni is cardioids, two cardioids back to back. Uh, this is the, the Braunmull Weber capsule design. So if you have, I'm not sure I've ever drawn this by hand, but if you have a cardioid facing front, so let's say this is front and then you, uh, you have the rear diaphragm is wired as well. And you put that in cardioid mode, then you get basically the same sort of thing in reverse. And that is Omni. When you add those together in phase, that's Omni. If you, um, if you put them out of phase, so you've got one cardioid like this and another cardioid like this, and this one's out of phase, really, I should say reversed polarity. This one has reversed polarity. What you end up with is that this cancels and you get basically figure eight. Uh, and then, so, so from Omni to figure eight, those are the two most extreme polar patterns. And so what that means is that you can manufacture any pattern. So in a multi-pattern microphone, there's a switch that's doing this for you. It's, it's turning the rear diaphragm on or off and either polarizing it so that it's equal polarity as the front, which gives you Omni or reversed polarity, which gives you figure eight. And then if it has some of the intermediate patterns like the wide cardioid and the hypercardioid, then what it's doing is lowering the relative volume of the rear as compared to the front. So, because for example, figure eight with a lower volume rear is basically hypercardioid, just as an example. So, so if you have a microphone that has two separate outputs, then you can just do this in your DAW. Okay, so you've got one track with front and one track with rear, and you, you use a plug-in to set the rear channel as either in phase or inverted. I should say same, same polarity uh, or inverted polarity. Uh, and then you set its relative volume level. So that way you can manufacture any polar pattern after the fact. So anyway, this, uh, this is something that we could build. So if people are interested in that, let me know. I know some folks asked for a tube mic build. We could definitely do that. Um, and then over here, I meant to go through this before. This is a whole giant bag of interesting things that uh, here's a prototype Roswell product, uh, noise tester that I'm building. Um, ah, this is the uh, transformer coupled 990 kit that we're offering as a custom build. There's all kinds of goodies in here. Um, looks like spare parts, rejected parts. Uh, we don't clean up as much as we ought to, but um, yeah, here's a new prototype of a, another 990 compatible kit. Here's another secret Roswell product. So anyway, um, it occurred to me that it might be fun to build some of these things. I mean, some of these are kind of secret. You know, the details of which are to be revealed, but it might be fun to build some of these things. So um, any feedback on that would be welcome. Um, oh, Matt Fox joined again. Hey, Matt. Nice comment. Yeah, so Matt's a pal. Um, Matt's, Matt Fox has been helping out with recording hacks, and he built the T25 and digs it and is high on the wait list for the new series of metalwork, which isn't here yet, but hopefully soon. Jason's interested in the SDC kit. Yeah, so we have uh, we have two small diaphragm kits. We've got the uh, SDC84, and we have the transformerless SDC. Let me grab those. Sorry, hiding in the back. 
so this is the this is the transformer list. This is basically uh, very very similar to the Shep CMC five. So this is a really nice implementation. Uh, it's a little tight to build. If you haven't seen this before, you know there's there's just not there's just not a lot of real estate here. And we wanted to use nice parts. Um, it's, I struggle to, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna make a kit that uses a bunch of cheap parts. I just don't see the point of that. So we really struggle. This is like revision three, I think. Um, and so you can see it's a pretty tight fit. And most of the resistors are installed vertically, meaning they're standing up on one end, the diodes too, which isn't really harder, but it's, it's just a little, I don't know, maybe it is harder. <laughs> because when, when you have a footprint like this, here, let me jump over here. So something like this uh, is, it's kind of unambiguous that something goes there because there's a box around it. But here's a, one of these vertical resistors. There's no box around it. So you just have to pay closer attention uh, to, uh, to where things go. And you know, to, the truth is I've never, I've never had anyone contact me for tech support and say that he you know, installed something spanning parts, you know, like instead of putting uh, R, this is R12 here, instead of putting R12 here, they put you know, one leg here and one leg here. I've never had anyone actually report that, but it seems like it would be risky just because it's not quite so clearly marked. We just didn't have that much room on this board to get parts on there. So, but I'm really proud of this new, uh, this new implementation. So we just came out with this. This is the microphone kit version. Uh, we just came out with this not so long ago. So this manual was updated in June. I think this one came out in, um, you know, I think we'd, uh, I think it was March, maybe April, we came out with the new improved revised version of this transformerless microphone kit, this STC microphone kit. And it's really great. It's really awesome. I'm very happy about that one. And then the STC84 is this one. It's easier to build than the transformer list because there's fewer parts in it. The transformer does a bunch of the work for you. I mean, in the in the typical Sheps, I mean, I'm going to generalize here, but about that much of this is output balancing. So, um, in the STC84, it's just a simpler kit, fewer parts. It is a tight fit as well, though. Um, you know, the transformer does take up some space, but at least the resistors get to lay down for the most part. So, um, but it's, uh, yeah, so, but these are, these are pretty nice. Um, I just had one here a minute ago and I don't see it, but we just revised the metalwork on these. Uh, when these were re-released in March or April or so. And uh, we used to make these at the same factory, meaning the metalwork. We used to make the metalwork at the same factory that makes a very popular brand. Um, and we really struggled to get the machining quality right. It didn't seem like they were capable of it. The new ones are much, much better. The metal is heavier, it's actually brass. The drilling is all, you know, the, the holes are precision placed. The bottom housing, at the bottom of the mic is just uh, a better design. This piece down here is just a better design. So, uh, so yeah, I'm really excited about this. These um, these have come a long way, and they're they're better for it. So yeah, we could definitely do one of those. So ETA for the V two fifty one kits. Will the cream color be available? Good question. Um, the we will have a limited number of V251 microphone kits in about two weeks. Uh, the timing is not under my control. Uh, we make the metalwork in China and the Chinese economy is, has gone through a really interesting time beca because of the pandemic. So they were affected before the rest of the world. So their production capacity plummeted um, January, February, March, in the, in the first part of the year. 
And then they were, came roaring back to life. And at that point, the rest of all their customers were struggling. But the weird thing for our particular corner of the world is that interest in microphones, uh, well, generally interest in music equipment skyrocketed because so many people were stuck at home during the, the early days of the pandemic. And I've talked to a bunch of gear manufacturers, especially music instrument manufacturers, whose business just went through the roof. They would describe it as it's been Christmas for three months, meaning they were selling as much or more in April, May, June, as they would normally sell in November. And that's a big, big deal. Um, the challenge is that they um, sold out. So the, the companies that still have stock are still selling and everyone else is like, I can't get stuff anymore. Because no one planned on no one planned on having four months of Christmas, you know, in second quarter. So what that means for us is that we got our metal work orders in in March, April, May, and they're not done yet. And now that they're partially done, partial shipments are ready, my logistics company is saying, I can't get space on a boat or a plane because they're all full of iPhone 12s and PS5s. So shipping is three times more expensive today as it was in January. And, um, and the timing is, uh, is slow as well. So to make a long story interminable, we should have some in about two weeks. They were supposed to ship last week, didn't. Sucks. Uh, I, I can't. I can't fix it. Um, but we'll have a few, and I will announce those in the newsletter. So if you're not subscribed, do that because the newsletter people will get first dibs on those. Um, we don't take pre-orders because until we have them in hand, we don't know what we're going to get. And it's absolutely happened that we've gotten stuff in and said, "Okay, we need to fix these." Um, in fact, uh, all the STCs came that way. There was a missed detail in the spec, and the circuit boards didn't fit in the XLR holder, it was an easy fix, but we had to buy special tools to do that. So we are manually remachining some, you know, one, one piece of the STC. Um, there have been other cases where we get stuff in that we just can't use. So we can't pre-sell because we don't know for sure what we're gonna get. Um, the second part of the question was, will the cream color be available? And the answer is no, uh, not right away, maybe in 2021. Uh, we'll see. The, the powder coat on that mic is fiendishly difficult to do. Uh, we just did a, a dozen of them, you know, six weeks ago or whenever we were running out and none of them were right. The powder went on so heavy that the engraved logo filled up. So that mic has engraved switch markings. Uh, I don't know if I have one out. Yeah, I don't have any... I don't have any metal work out to show, but um, the engraved switch markings filled up, the logo filled up. So we're not gonna do engraved logos anymore. So that particular thing wouldn't be a problem, but uh, powder coating looks nice, but it's expensive. And the fail rate or the reject rate is on that mic, it's about 80%. Um, stripping it off is extraordinarily difficult because powder coat is durable, super durable. So you need some really funky chemicals or a giant oven to strip it off. And those are, Neither of those is very environmentally friendly and we do try to be eco-conscious. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I'd like to eventually offer them uh, in part because I have a, a warehouse full of power supply lids that are powder coated that color. And it would be nice to be able to match the mics to the power supplies. So we'll see if we can offer those. So I think that's it. Um, thank you all for joining. Really appreciate your support. If you have any feedback, I'm easy to reach. Um, you can leave a comment. Um, I suppose as a new YouTuber, I'm supposed to say like, and what's the other thing? Subscribe, something like that. So if you could do that, that would be great. Uh, if you could leave a comment with uh, any feedback, that would be awesome too. Um, hopefully we'll tune in again next Saturday and build something else. So yeah, look forward to that.